This might sound a little bit morbid today, but I want to ask you to ask yourself this question. What's going to matter on my deathbed? Like right before I take my last breath, what's going to really matter? What am I going to be thinking of? Am I going to be thinking about God's kingdom, heaven, eternity? Or am I going to be thinking about my kingdom, the sadness I have for leaving this earth? This week, we're going to see Jacob and Joseph leave the pages of Scripture, and we're going to see why it matters that we end really well. All right, good morning. Welcome to our series in Genesis. For those of you that are here, we're glad you're here. If you're new, super happy you're joining us. If you're watching us however you found us, we're glad you're watching or listening because today is our final lesson in the book of Genesis. Now, before we start, like, I'm going to tell you something that happened that was kind of funny, but nobody really cares about my eating habits, but I'm going to tell you this anyway, okay? So after Thanksgiving, Oh, wait, the other thing I had to tell you, too, is over there, somebody, um, somebody gave us a whole bunch of these. They're the crosses, and um, they're, they're really pretty. They're hand-painted, and she donated them all so that you could make a donation to Bible study. So if you want those over there, they're over there. Just take them, and just you can make a donation. Cindy will be taking money this morning or whatever. So I meant to say that, and I forgot. Okay, back to my eating problems. Um, okay, so uh, since Thanksgiving, I got on this pumpkin pie kick. Okay, because I eat chocolate cake every day, and then now I'm on pumpkin pie. So I, I, I started getting you know, whipped cream. It, it was like, it's been the best. So I have a piece of it every day or two, whatever. Okay. <laughs> and then I was talking to someone about it, and they're like, wow, did you know pumpkin pie is healthy? Okay, well, so we know that healthy is, is super important to me, right? <laughs> so I Googled it, and I'm like, is pumpkin pie healthy? And they're like, it's a great vegetable to eat. Okay. The word vegetable just ruined it for me. <laughs> I'm, my daughter's like, well, it's a squash. I'm like, so basically I'm eating squash pie with whipped cream on it. Okay, that, and then, so last night I was eating it. I just, I'm having a hard time eating it now just because I know that. So. <laughs> so I think I'm going back to chocolate cake. So, all right. Today is going to be our final lesson in Genesis. It's been two years since we started with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Two years ago, we, we started that. And then from there, we saw how he created everything, and then man and woman, uh, Adam and Eve. And uh, at this time, they had this perfect relationship with God until this event. Now, we will revisit our Skit Guys funny video. This is them being Adam and Eve and what happened at the fall. I thought we could maybe share together, okay? Oh. It's a, uh, well, that's, that's an apple. Well, it's an unidentified fruit from the Old Testament, yes. <laughs> I was going to call it a Mac, but that's fine. <laughs> so what do you say? It looks good, but which tree did you get it Just from? Just over there. No, no, I need, you, I need you to tell me which uh, tree. I got it from the Smarty Tree. The tree of knowledge. Whatever. No, the tree God told us to eat, not to eat from. It is not like that. No, it is like no, that. No, it's we, not. We, if God said not to do it, we shouldn't do it. That's a boundary. We shouldn't cross it. Oh, listen, it is not like that. No, it okay? is. No, no, you listen, okay? Here's the way it was. I was over there one day near it, right? And this little feller came whoa, up. Whoa, whoa, little feller? I'm uh -huh. the only guy here. I know, that's weird, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> so this little guy came up, you know, and I was looking at it, and all of a sudden he comes up, and he's like, mmm, that sure does look yummy. So he had a, uh, a tongue problem. He had a speech impediment, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, it does look good, but we're not supposed to look at it or eat it or nothing. Oh, you know, yeah. that's what I told Swung him. Your hip I, I used my hip to show him I was serious. Nothing, uh -huh. you know, I said that to him. Nothing, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so and you're adamant. I was, no, I'm Eve. But anyway, mm -hmm. I, here's the thing. So he, I said, nothing, you know? Uh, uh, uh. And he looked at me and he said this, it makes sense. He goes, did God really say not to do nothing? <laughs> and I was like, well, I think so, you know? So it's kind of confusing you. I was a bit confused yeah. with his logic, you know? <laughs> and then all of a sudden he looked at me and said, if you eat that, you'll be like God. <laughs> 
And so I picked out, I thought, we might share it together. What do you say? It looks yummy, huh? Even though we should not oh, do come that. On. Eva, Don't touch me! Eva, I'm Don't so touch! And this is where the codependency begins. Let's, let's eat the apple. I know, it looks good, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, ladies first. That's where that's from. What, what's, what's the matter? Take a back. <laughs> All right, there you go. And that's what we learned at the beginning of Genesis, okay? We saw that because of that scene right there, how the whole entire world became filled with sin and sickness and disease. And, and the worst part about that is that when everyone is born now, they're born separated from God. That's just the way it is, all because of that. Then, then we saw in Genesis, Noah comes on the scene and, and God floods the entire world. The problem is, is that sin has infected us on the inside. The, the sin nature is what's, what's hurt on us on the inside. So all the flood can take away all the people, but even through Noah and his sons, there's still something that's going to be passed down. And what we see and what we saw in Genesis all through is that a holy God and sinful man are not compatible. They're just not. That's why we're born separated from God. But then God had a plan, and he had a plan to bridge this gap between us and him. It's kind of like, you know, to reconcile us back to a relationship with him. And this plan is what Genesis has been all about. Because this plan began, began with a man named Abraham, who then had a son named Isaac, who then had a son named Jacob, who then had 12 sons. And God would use this family to start a nation called the Israelites, the Hebrews. We know them as the Jewish, the Jewish nation. But through this particular nation, through, through Abraham's descendants, would come Jesus. Jesus. God himself would come to this earth and be born into this particular people group. So that is basically what Genesis is all about. Now, finishing our story out today, Jacob and his family have now moved to Egypt because of a famine. And unbeknownst to him, it would be through all 12 of his sons that their families would stay in Egypt. They will be there for 400 years. They're going to grow to over 2 million people in, in that particular family. And then in 400 years, Moses will come on the scene. Remember, God will be like, oh, tell, my, you know, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. This is, this is the people that's in Egypt right now. It, it, this is their descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and this whole group. Now, at this time, the 400 years, for those 400 years, the Israelites would be slaves, and they would have to work really hard for Pharaoh. And this is not the life that Jacob probably thought would happen to his descendants. But it, it was all because God had a plan. And it was just a reminder to me that, that God has a plan, even in the time, when we say this, God is always doing something. And some of you are at a place in your life right now where you're just like, I don't understand what God is doing. It's so frustrating to me. But just know, he's there. He's doing something. We talked a lot about that in last week's lesson. So today, Jacob's going to leave the pages of Scripture. God had given him a, a promise for a land, which we know as Israel, a promise for a people group we know as the Jews. But I think for most of his life, if you think about Jacob when we've been studying him, I don't think he ever felt that promise. Sometimes we take the promises of the Bible and we're just like, yeah, I don't think God really meant that for me. No, he really does. So I want you to know that. Whatever promises God has made in the Bible, they are specifically for you too. But for Jacob, I felt like, you know, he never really pretty much understood what was going on. Think about his life. He had to go on the run for his life from his brother Esau. Esau wanted to kill him because, he, because Jacob stole his birthright. Um, then Jacob had to go work for his uncle way up north so his brother wouldn't kill him. Uh, for 14 years, he ended up with two wives and two concubine whatevers. 
And um, he had 13 kids by four different women. His daughter was raped. His two sons go on a mass murder spree and kill all the people in the town where this happened. The wife that he loved died in childbirth. His favorite son, Joseph, disappears, and the, the 11, 10 brothers say, oh, Joseph died, okay? So, so he thinks Joseph is dead. There's a famine. The sons come back and say, oh, P.S., Joseph's really alive. He's second in command to Pharaoh in Egypt. And so now they're all in Egypt, and Jacob is going to die. Let's pick it up in 47, verse 29. When the time drew near for Israel, now whenever you see the word Israel here, it also means Jacob, that was his other name. When the time drew near for Israel to die, he called for his son Joseph, remember Joseph's his favorite son, and said to him, if I have found favor in your eyes, put your hand under my thigh and promise that you will show kindness and faithfulness. Now, putting a, your hand under someone's thigh at that time was kind of like an oath, like you're shaking hands, you're making a promise. And this is what he asked him to do, do not bury me in Egypt. But when I rest with my fathers, carry me out of Egypt and bury me where they are buried. I will do as you say, he said. Swear to me, he said. Then Joseph swore to him, and Israel worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Jacob was ending his life worshipping God. And that was kind of important for me to see, because Jacob, as you know, has not been my favorite you know, person in, in Genesis. But he wanted to be buried in the land of Israel. Now, I'm going to show you a picture that some of you are going to be like, ugh, that's gross. You don't have to look. I'll tell you before I put it up. The Egyptians knew how to preserve people very, very well. And they, when, you know, many years ago, they unearthed Pharaoh Ramses II. Okay, and, and because of Egypt and how they did all the embalming and all this, when they unearthed him, we're talking 4,000 years later, he still had skin and he still had hair. If you don't want to see it, you can shut your eyes, but this is it. Kind of gross, but you can actually see what he looked like. He had hair and he had skin. This is what they did in, in, in Egypt. This is how they embalmed people to where, you know. Now, it's interesting because Joseph and Jacob are both embalmed, but they're in, in Israel. So I always wonder, like, if we could get in those tombs and see, we could actually see what they look like. But anyway, that's gross. I'll put that picture up. So there's that. Um, so Jacob didn't care about being embalmed in, e in Egypt. Jacob wanted to be buried in the land of his people. And when I see how he's leaving this earth, I really do like, I do like him a little bit more. Because for as difficult as his life was, he had what so many people that we're seeing don't have, and that is yeah, this, long suffering and perseverance. We are seeing so many people walk away from their faith. They're not even getting to Jacob's age. They're just like all done with God because he didn't come through for them, he didn't answer their prayer, and so I'm mad at God, I'm gonna walk away from my faith. And it just reminded me of the verse in Matthew, I think it's Matthew 24, where Jesus says, um, those that persevere to the end will be saved. So there's something really important about our faith and persevering to the end. Yes, things didn't go the way I thought they would, but I'm going to persevere because Jesus is more important than anything. So that's kind of where we see this. But for 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 that's what we see with Jacob, this whole long-suffering and perseverance. No matter how bad his life went, he really did end his life caring for the things of God. There was a um, magazine, Runner's World. It was telling a story about this girl. Her name was Beth Ann DeSantis. And she was trying to qualify for the Olympics marathon event. But she had to complete a 26.2-mile race in less than two hours and 45 minutes. Like, that was to qualify, that's what she had to do. So she started out really good, but about the 23rd mile, she started really struggling. She had two minutes left to go, two minutes, and uh, she stumbled and fell to the ground. And she was dazed, she didn't know. People are yelling at her like, get up, get up, you can do this, you can finish. So there's less than a minute left. She gets up and she begins to walk to the finish line, and then she falls again. And the crowd is just screaming, you can do this, you can do this. And as the final seconds ticked away, she crawled on her hands and knees to the finish line, stretched until her hands went over it, and she made it with three seconds left. Okay. The point to that is she never quit. If you fall, if you have tragedy in your life, if you have something that's happened that you don't understand, please do not walk away from your faith. Finish strong. Because there's so much more, as we'll talk about, in, in what happens after we die than actually here on this earth. And we want to live for Jesus so, that that, so that's what happens after there. Um, okay, 
What we learn from uh, Jacob as, we le- as he leaves the pages of Scripture is this. It doesn't matter how we start. It does matter how we finish. So I just want to remind you that sometimes we start and you know, we become you know, Christian. It's kind of slow starting or whatever. But it really matters that we continue in our faith and we finish well. And, and how you're going to know that is what you talk about on your deathbed. And, and like I said, I know that sounds a little morbid, but, but on someone's deathbed, they should be excited about where they're going. Like for Jacob, he wants to talk about God. And to me, that's very, very impressive. Speaking of getting older, this made me laugh. There was a little girl, her, her grandmother had all these little duck figurines. So, her, so the granddaughter goes over and her grandmother's like taking all the duck figurines and they're moving, she's moving them from one shelf to the other and she's trying to straighten them and all that. And the granddaughter's like, Grandma, what are you doing? And she goes, the grandmother answered and says, I'm just trying to get my ducks in a row. <laughs> okay, now the reason why I tell you that is because that's what Jacob is getting ready to do. Jacob is going to get his ducks in a row for the end of his life. We'll pick it up in Genesis 48. Sometime later, now here's what you need to know when it says sometimes later. I don't know when this is. The option is he's 130 years old, he just gets to Egypt, and he thinks he's dying. Could be that. Or it could be when he's 147 years old, so he's been, he'll be in Egypt 17 years. So we don't really know at what point he, this is happening. So he says, sometimes later, Joseph was told, your father is ill. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, so you need to remember those names, along with him. When Jacob was told, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel rallied his strength and sat up on the bed. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan. He's going to talk to Joseph, his son, about his amazing God. And this is like when he thinks he's dying. He says, and there he blessed me. And he said to me, I am going to make you fruitful and increase in your numbers, and I will make you a community of peoples, and I will give this land as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. Now, we know that all of these things have come to fruition and still are to this day. We know that Jacob was fruitful. There's about 70, 66 to 70, who now are with him in Egypt. We know the 70 turned into 2 million, and we know Jacob's descendants, who are the Jews, are still in the land of of Israel, and we know that Jesus will come back and rule and reign from there. So everything that was prophesied, you know, way back then, you know, 4,000-ish years ago, is, is coming to fruition today, has already come to, and is still with the land of Israel. So the next part is going to feel a little bit confusing, so you're going to have to hang with me for a second. Here is what's happening. You have over here the right, of course, we always called this Israel or Jacob's dysfunctional family tree, okay, because it was a disaster. Over to the left is this is the land. So once Moses comes on the scene, gets all the Israelites out of, out of Egypt, you know, they wander around the wilderness for 40 years. Joshua gets them in the land. All the boys on the right will have a portion of the land on the left. So that's what this is, this is all about. Now, what you see on there is if you looked closely, you would see two names that aren't there. Joseph is not there, and Levi is not there. Levi is the third down on the left, Joseph on the far right. But what you do see are Joseph's sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. You see Manasseh, the brown in the middle, and then Ephraim, the orange, below it. So what's happening is you'll see it in this next scene. Uh, Joseph or Jacob is going to kind of adopt these two boys of Joseph's as his own. So watch this. Now then, your two sons born to you in Egypt before I came to you here will be reckoned as mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. It's like Jacob is adopting Joseph's two sons and so that they would get portions of this land. He goes on in verse 6. He says, any children born to you after them will be yours. In the territory they inherit, they will be reckoned under the names of their brothers. In other words, you can have 20 other kids. They're not getting a portion of the land. Just like it's only going to be your first two, Manasseh and Ephraim. He goes in verse 7. As I was returning from Padan to my sorrow, Rachel, if we look back, you can see Rachel's um, uh, Joseph's mom. And this is Jacob's love of his life. So to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan while we were still on the way a little distance from Ephrath. So I buried her there beside the road. It's in Bethlehem. If you ever want to go to Bethlehem and see Rachel's tomb, you actually can see where she was buried. Then he says something interesting, which makes me think that this is, these boys are younger. 
Because they're either, when he first gets to, when Jacob first gets to Egypt, they're probably, the boys are probably, let's say, six or seven. He's there for 17 years, or they could be in their 20s. So that's what I'm saying. But he says this. He says, when, it, I'll, you'll see it in a second. When Israel saw the sons of Joseph, he asks, who are these? Now, it's really interesting because it's like, how do you not know your grandsons? And then it makes sense if this was the beginning when they first get to Egypt. Or it could be because he's 130, or it's because he's 147, he's going blind. I always say we probably should give him a break, okay? Um, kind of like this doctor. <laughs> There's this patient that comes to the doctor's office, and he's, he's freaking out. And he's like, doctor, my memory's gone. He goes, I'm so upset, I don't know what to do. He goes, I, I can't remember my wife's name. I can't remember my children's name. I can't remember what car I drive. And the doctor goes, calm down, calm down. When did this happen? How long, is, how long have you been like this? And he goes, like what? <laughs> I already forgot. <laughs> so this is probably what's happening to Jacob, okay? He's kind of forgetting things. Verse 9. Uh, are we at 9 up there? And, and, and Joseph's like, well, like, Dad, they're the sons God has given me here, Joseph said to his father. Then Israel said, bring them to me so I may bless them. Now, Israel's eyes were failing, so we see that Jacob's, you know, going blind because of his old age, and he could hardly see. So Joseph brought his sons close to him, and his father kissed them and embraced them. Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, and now God has allowed me to see your children too. Then Joseph removed from Israel's knees and bowed down with his face to the ground. So he took the boys, took them off his knees, which makes me think they're probably younger at this particular time. So this might be before, you know, right after he gets to Egypt. But it's really fascinating to me where he says, he, Joseph bowed down with his face to the ground because that's what I think our culture is missing. We don't, we don't honor our elders any longer. Um, and we see this with Joseph. Joseph is second in command to Pharaoh in Egypt. But he's a really, really important person. And yet here he is bowing down to his 130-year-old father, elderly father. And yet we see that. I was talking to a girl this summer, and she's a teacher. Uh, she's a junior high teacher. And um, she said, I don't think I can do this very much longer. She goes, I have never seen such disrespectful children in all my life. They don't care about adults. They don't care about... There's no respect whatsoever. And I thought, wow, you look at this story, you see how much they respected their elders back then. All right, verse 13. I have a lot of scripture to cover, so it's going to be a lot of Bible. Joseph took them both, Ephraim on his right toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh on his left toward Israel's right hand, and he brought them close to him. But Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head, though he was the youngest, and crossing his arms, he put his left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my father, Abraham and Isaac, walked faithfully. This is my favorite line. The God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. Like he's looking back at his life and as difficult as it has been, he's like, God has been my shepherd. He's been leading me all along. He said, the angel who delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May they be called by my name and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly on this earth. But the problem is Joseph sees that there's an issue with this because his dad is about ready to bless the wrong child. He's probably chalking it up to like, oh, dad can't see or whatever. Because in that culture, the older son always got the blessing, the double portion, the double blessing. He would get double land. He would be the one in charge of the family. And so the, Joseph's looking at this and going, this is wrong, dad. You're, you're giving this blessing to the wrong child. But what we've seen throughout Genesis is that God, there's times when God has changed that. He's, made, he's completely changed because remember when Ishmael was born, Ishmael and Isaac? Uh, Ishmael was the firstborn, but the blessing went to Isaac. You see Jacob himself, who's the, who's the grandfather here. Uh, Jacob was, uh, he, his brother Esau had the blessing, but Jacob stole the blessing, and then he ended up getting it, which was bad, but good, but whatever. So the younger is getting blessed and, and getting the blessings and not the older. So this is about ready to happen again. Verse 17, when Joseph saw his father placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased. So he took a hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to him, no, my father, this, is the one, this one is the firstborn. You, you put your right hand on his head. 
But his father refused and said, I know my son, I know. He too will become a people and he too will become great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he and his descendants will become a group of nations. He blessed them that day and said this, in your name will Israel pronounce this blessing. May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Isn't that interesting? Then Israel said to Joseph, I am about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. This was a reassurance to Joseph that yes, you're in Egypt. Yes, your family's here. Yes, we are all here. But one day, God has promised that that land in Israel is yours and you will be back. He's trying to encourage Joseph that your story is not going to end here. And then he says this, And to you I will give one more ridge of land than to your brothers, the ridge I took from the Amorites and with my sword and my bow. Now, this is what it's going to look like. As you just could see, uh, Levi's not there and, and Joseph's not there. Ephraim and Manasseh, they are there. So that fills out the, the entire you know, map of what's going to happen. And Jacob now is realizing that his life is about ready to end. Someone wrote this, and I thought this is cute. They said, there's seven stages to life, and they're all summed up in a word. The first stage is spills. Okay, this is when you're born, you're a baby, you grab something, you spill it, there's juice, there's water, whatever, you're just constantly spilling things. That's the first stage of life. The second stage is drills. This is when you go to school and suddenly you're tested or, or drilled all the time, um, getting knowledge on how to live. The third stage is thrills, okay? You're growing up, you're becoming a teenager, you're going off to college, you're becoming independent. Life is thrilling, you're just having fun. And then you re reach the fourth stage, bills. <laughs> you have to pay for it, okay? So life now takes on a whole different meaning as now you're responsible for the choices that you make. Then you have the fifth stage, the fifth stage is ills, okay? As we get older, uh, things just, we're just not as resilient as we used to be. Like, we have more aches and pains, and I look at Rob, like, he's, he's getting ready to get knee surgery, and, you know, our backs hurt more, and it just, it just, it's just this, this, the stage of ills. Then the sixth stage is this, pills. <laughs> to manage the ills, now we have to have a lot of pills, all right? Just to maintain our life, we have to be on medication. And finally, the seventh stage is this, wills, okay? <laughs> and this is pretty much where Jacob is right now. He's at the stage of wills, but, but it's going to be different with his boys because this isn't like you get the house, you get the car, you get whatever, and you get the money in my bank account. It's not like that. This is the stage where it's more like a legacy, He's, Jacob's going to prophesy over each one of these 12 boys and tell them what their descendants are going to be like, especially when they get into this land in Israel. So let's pick up in 49 verse 1. Then Jacob called his sons and said, Gather around so I can tell you what will happen to you in the days to come. Assemble and listen, sons of Jacob. Listen to your father Israel. All the boys are there, 12 boys, and I want you to remember who 10 of those boys are. These are the boys that threw Joseph in the, in the pit, pulled him out, sold him to traitors, lied to their dad. Ten of these boys. Watch this. Brothers! Brothers, look what Father's given me! Father's given him another gift. Levi? Judah, what are you doing? You're scaring me. Stop it! There's no need to be afraid. We just want to try on your new cloak. Come here! No! Judah! Stop! Do not harm him! Anyone want to try his new coat? <laughs> okay, so if you remember that back way back when we in the many many 
months ago. Uh, these are the boys. These are the boys who hated Joseph so badly that they did all this. I mean, the hatred in them festered. It, it was a way that, that God wanted to get Joseph to um, Egypt. So these are the boys, these 10 boys, and Joseph and Benjamin, his little brother, that, are, are, that his dad is about ready to talk to. Now, since that time, these boys have repented. They've, they've apologized to Joseph. They've apologized to their father. They've really come around to, to love Joseph and his family. But now he's going to, Jacob's going to talk to each one of these boys and give them something about their life. Jacob starts with Reuben, okay? Now, I want you to see here, Reuben is the first child of Leah. And then over here, I, I put um, the arrow where you can see that's Reuben's portion of his land in Israel. He goes on to say this, Reuben, you are my firstborn. Now, if you think about this, Reuben being his firstborn should be the one that gets the double blessing, the one who runs the family, but it's not like that. He's given that to Joseph's two boys. Um, he goes on to say, uh, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power. Now, Reuben's probably thinking, yes, dad's got some great stuff to say about me, until he gets to verse 4. He says, turbulent is the waters. You will no longer excel, for you went up onto your father's bed, onto my couch, and defiled it. Now, Reuben's sin, if you look up there at the list, you go Leah, Zilpah, Billa, and Rachel. Uh, Billa and Rachel were the, the maids of, of his mom and aunt. And um, he went and had sex with Billa. Okay, this was not something you, he should have done, but he did it. Like, this is like he slept with his dad's concubine. It's kind of weird, creepy, weird. So he lost his place being firstborn and the blessings because of his sin. And what he says is Reuben's descendants would not grow up and excel. And, and, and it reminded me of this. We all have choices in life. And, and choices that we make bring consequences. It just does. Laurel Hunsinger grew up in Kansas. He flew combat missions in the Korean War. On April 1st, 1953, his plane was shot down 15 miles inside North Korea. He was severely injured. They ended up getting out. He got a purple heart and all that. But before he died... He was talking to some friends, and he said, he was explaining something he saw when he, was, when he was in the military. He said, when I worked on the flight line in Korea, he goes, we would walk past a post that was set in the ground that everyone had to walk past. Someone carved into the post these words, you always have two chances. You always have two chances. You, can make a, you have two chances, you can make a good decision or make a bad decision. That's kind of what the point was. He said this, he said, when Hunsinger asked what that meant, he said, well, when you go and fly a combat mission, you have two chances. Um, there's a chance you will make it back to the base, or there's a chance you'll be shot down. He said, now, if you're shot down, you'll have two chances. Uh, the, 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 your chances are you'll either survive the crash, or you won't. If you, have, if you survive the crash, you'll have two chances. You'll evade the enemy, or you'll be captured. If you're captured, you'll have two chances. You'll live through being a prisoner, or you won't. If you die a prisoner, you'll have two chances. You're either going to go to heaven or you'll go to hell. Everything is based on the choices that we make in life. And we always have, a ch we have you know, chances to go here or chances to go here. And unfortunately for, for Reuben, he did not make good choices in his life. And he, there's lots of consequences to that. The next two brothers also didn't make good choices. Simeon and Levi, you can see Simeon right there uh, on the list. Simeon is a very, very bottom down there on the map. He's, under, he's, he's farthest down. Levi, remember, or I haven't told you this yet, Levi won't get any land at all. And you can kind of see it here. Simeon and Levi are brothers. These are, the, these are the two boys that murdered went on that murderous rampage. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly, for they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Cursed to be their fierce anger, so fierce in their fury, so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. Now, the tribe of Levi would never have their own land. They literally will be dispersed throughout Israel. Everything Jacob said is, has, you know, has come true. Um, Simeon down there would be absorbed into Judah above him in, when it came time for land. So really, they're just kind of, because of what they did in their life, there was huge consequences. I just want to tell you real quick, Levi, if you look at the, the descendants of Levi, uh, you have Moses, Aaron, and John the Baptist. They all come from the tribe of Levi because it's a, a priestly tribe, so they kind of thought that was interesting. All right, next we have Judah. 
Judah is over there. He's uh, whatever son that is. Another one, two, three, fourth son. He goes on to say this. Judah, um, the reason why this, this is going to be a longer uh, prophecy because from Judah comes Jesus. So from Judah's lineage would come, um, would come first King David and then Jesus. Judah he says this, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. Uh, now here's the bad part about Judah. If you remember him, Judah was the one who slept with his daughter-in-law, Tamar. She dressed up, pretended to be a prostitute. There was that whole really bad situation. But Jacob doesn't bring that up. Jacob brings none of that up. And I think it's because Judah is the one who tried to save Joseph's life. Way back when the brothers wanted to kill him and throw him in the cistern, Judah's the one that's going, no, 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 let's just sell him to traitors. Let's not kill him. And then we see him also with um, um, Joseph and Benjamin. They're, Joseph's going to throw Benjamin in, in jail. And Judah's like, no, 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 I'll take his place. L let me do it. And so he's really been helpful to the family. And I think Jacob realizes his importance in the family. And, um, and then we see this. Look at this verse. You are a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness who dares to rouse him. Now, it's really fascinating if you take this in Genesis and you go all the way to Revelation 5.5. 5. There's a scene in heaven where there's a scroll and they're saying, no one's worthy to open the scroll and Jesus is standing there. And look at what this says in Revelation 5.5. 5. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He's able to open the scroll and it's seven seals. In Genesis, you have Judah and, you know, and then you've got the, the reference to the lion and then you have this all the way back into the end of Revelation. Jacob goes on to say this in verse 10. He says, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs and the obedience of the nations is his. A scepter is a symbol of authority or a king, and we know that Jesus is coming back to be king of kings on this earth. And all of this we're reading about in Genesis. So you can kind of see the Bible as this, this whole big, beautiful story that God wants us to understand. Um, I would say it doesn't make sense to them at all, but it does to us looking back. Then, then we see this here, and I will just tell you, I have no idea what this means. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his ropes in blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. Now, some people think this speaks of the thousand-year reign. Uh, so it, this seems to have an end-time prophecy to it, so I, I, don't, I don't have an answer for that. Go on to the next child, Zebulun. If you look over here, he's the one way down there on, on one of Leah's kids. Zebulun will live by the seashore, become a haven for ships. His border will extend towards Sidon. If you look at the map up there, I put an a, a arrow. You can see that he actually, his tribe is not right on the Mediterranean Sea. But it's interesting that it says, we'll live by the seashore. And you're like, well, that doesn't make sense because he really didn't live by the seashore. So this is what I found out about that. While not directly on the Mediterranean coast, the tribe of Zebulun was assigned land close enough to the sea to make the transport of goods profitable for the people. Zebulun was located on an important route that carried merchandise from the coast to the Sea of Galilee and to Damascus. For the most part, the Jews weren't seafaring people, but the tribe of Zebulun did business with the people east of them, provided imported goods to the people west of them. So they had a place there. Let's move on to Issachar. Issachar is a raw-boned donkey lying between two saddlebags. When he sees how good his resting place is and how pleasant is his land, he will bend his shoulder to the burden and submit to forced labor. Now you can see him. He's also up there. They, he borders, um, it looks like really good land up there. They're right by the Sea of Galilee. And so it's interesting because these people were not afraid of hard work up there. So I have to tell you my funny story about... about um, Women, women who stay home with their children. It's, an, it's a thankless job, and it's very difficult to do. And so, I don't know why this made me laugh. One afternoon, a man comes home, and he, he finds his, his, he drives up, and he sees his whole house just in mayhem. And his three children are outside. They're in their pajamas. They're playing in the mud. There's empty, you know, food wrappers all over everything. His door, his wife's door, 
car door is wide open. The front door is wide open. He doesn't know what's going on. He runs in the house. He sees a, a lamp had been knocked over. A throw rug was, you know, not where it was supposed to be. He runs by the front room where the TV's, you know, blaring loud cartoons. There's toys and clothes strewn everywhere. He makes it into the kitchen. He sees the, the sink is filled with dishes, breakfast foods everywhere on the floor, dog foods all over the floor, broken glass. Like He's like, something is really wrong in my house. He goes running upstairs as he's you know, jumping over all the toys and the mess because he's like, something's wrong. With my wife must be sick or ill or something must have happened. He flings open the bedroom door and finds his wife lounging on the bed, curled up in her pajamas, reading a novel, okay? She looks up at him and she goes, hi, honey, what, what, how was your day today? And he just looks at her and goes, what in the world just happened? Like, wh wh what is this, okay? And she said, well, you know how every day you come home and, and you ask me, what in the world did you do today? <laughs> she goes, now you know, okay? <laughs> But that's it. It's like hard-working, devoted mothers. Like it's, they don't know what they do, but, but this is what the descendants of Issachar would be. Very hard-working, devoted to the soil. But it's kind of interesting. This tribe produced no heroes, no, no people. But what they did is they worked hard. And, and what it's a reminder to us is that we need all kinds of people for life to run smoothly. We need people who are farmers and truck drivers and store owners and teachers and policemen and I would say politicians, but probably not that, okay? Um, I was talking to uh, Rob, our, our normal sound guy isn't here, and so Noah took his place this morning. And he said to me, as we were talking, he said, you know, he goes, I, I always wanted to do something to, for the Lord. And so he, and he, he works now at a very large church in their music, you know, all this, he loves computers, but that's his place. But it's not just, I just want to do this, I want to do this for Jesus. And it was this reminder of that's what... And whatever job we have, whatever lot we have in life, our, our goal is to do that and serve God while we're doing that. So what I realized is that when you look at all of these kids, they're all in different parts of the land. They all have different jobs. They're created completely different. And so I just wanted to remind you, please embrace the gifts that God has given you. Embrace the talents. Embrace your job. Embrace your life. Like, don't try to be someone else. Not everyone is called to be a Joseph. Not everyone is called to be an Issachar. Uh, we were talking, I, we have a friend of ours that's a Christian apologist, and I was, had a question, so I called him the other day, and we were talking, and he was giving me a list of all these books that he was reading, and I started laughing because I'm thinking, I've never even heard of these authors before because he's uber smart. Um, but then it dawned on me that I'm, I'm not supposed to be reading those books. I read books on missionaries and, and helping us understand what it means to follow Jesus. So we each have our part. My husband, you know Rob, he's an encourager. I'm not that encouraging. Okay, that's his job to do that. But that's just like we all have different gifts, so let's be who we're supposed to be, okay? Now, we've been going through lists and lists and lists of Bible names, so we'll have to watch a funny John Christ video about this. Because kids, these days, like every kid in my family, very Christian family, every kid is a name from the Bible. Everyone has a Bible name in our family. Anybody got a Bible name up here in the front? What you got, man? Samuel. Samuel, what did he do? You don't know. <laughs> Didn't listen, I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> anybody else got one? What you got, ma'am? Mary. Mary? <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming. I got nothing for that. I got nothing for that. My, every, my name's John. I asked my, this is a true story. I asked my mom, but why'd you name me John? They said, we named you after John the Baptist. I go, me? I don't think I'm doing a very good job. John the Baptist, dude, this man baptized Christ, was martyred for his faith. I used a coupon at Wendy's yesterday. <laughs> Like, just stop naming your kids Bible names. It's not helping, it's not lying. My, dude, my nephew is named Malachi. His name is Malachi. Malachi in the Bible, this man was a warrior, prophet, strong. My nephew Malachi, extreme peanut allergy. Just. Uh-uh, dude, Malachi in the Bible, this man hunted for his own food. This kid wears a teething necklace. Mm. It's embarrassing. No, my sister would be like, oh, he's reading about Malachi, reading the story of Malachi. One day when you get to heaven, you're going to meet the real Malachi. The real Malachi is going to be embarrassed. <laughs> you're bad for the brand, dude, you know? <laughs> the kids are naming the kids Bible names. They're not even good kids. You've seen these? Here's our son, Paul. I've seen that kid. That's Saul. Dude, that's a bad... <laughs> 
The name should line up. That's all I'm saying. The name should line up. I got a buddy named Caleb. His name is Caleb. Just like, I know. It's like Caleb in the Bible, this man was a warrior, led the children of Israel into battle, took the land of milk and honey. My buddy Caleb, allergic to milk and honey. Just. <laughs> okay, we got to see him. He was here in Phoenix, and we got to see him on Friday night. And I honestly don't think I've ever laughed so hard in my entire life, okay? So he's really, really funny. All right, that's our little break. Now we got to keep going, all right? Billa's, if you look here, you see now we're moving from Leah's kids over to Billa. She is uh, Rachel's maid. Now, if you remember, Rachel couldn't have kids. And she was barren and at the time, so she gave her maid, Billa, to sleep with Jacob so that she could have kids and kind of be like, okay, these kids are mine, but that just never worked out that way. So the first son of Billa was Dan, okay? Look up there, we see Dan will provide justice for his people as one of the tribes of Israel. So the word Dan means to judge. His tribe produced one of the most famous judges, Samson. Okay, so it's interesting that everything Jacob's saying actually happened. When you read the Bible, you go, oh, Jacob told us that was going to happen. Speaking of judges, this made me laugh. Guy wanted a divorce. He comes to the judge and he said, I just can't take it anymore. Every night, my wife is out at the bars, going from bar to bar to bar, out every single night. And the judge says, well, what's she doing? And the guy says, well, she's looking for me. <laughs> oh, all right, Dan, where you go. Dan will be a serpent by the roadside, a viper along the path that bites the horse's heels so that its riders tumble backwards. Now, I'm going to go back and show this to you really quick. See where Dan is over there? Bottom left uh, above the pink. Okay, a little thing of Dan right there. That's where Dan was. Apparently, he didn't like to be by the Mediterranean Sea. I don't know what happened, but if you look at this next slide, he moves his whole tribe up north. That is on the border, the borders like Lebanon. So now you're hearing a lot about the, you know, what's the Lebanon and Iran and the, it's coming, the, 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 the lobbing bombs or whatever into. That's up there. That would be the, the, where Dan's tribe was. But how he got there is just what, what Jacob just said. He's like a viper. He, he's like, he, he sneaks up on people. And that's what they did. To get there, that, where Dan is up there used to be a place called Laish. And they went in and conquered Laish and just like took it from them. And then I want to show you this picture. This is kind of cool. The left picture over there is in Dan. If you ever go to Israel, it's up north. Um, you can actually see that, that left picture right there. Uh, King Jeroboam, at some point after Dan was there, two centuries later, he set up an idolatrous calf for the Israelites to worship so they wouldn't have to go all the way to Jerusalem. It was a bad deal. But that happened in Dan, and that's, that's the location of that. The right picture is really fascinating. They just unearthed this pretty recently. This dates back to Abraham, all the way back to Abraham. So when Abraham went up, remember when um, Lot and then they, they kidnapped Lot and they took him up north? Well, they're pretty sure that Abraham walked through this gate. If you see that arch right there, it's one of the first arch gates that they've ever you know, un uncovered. So anyway, that is all up in Dan. Then Jacob, I think, is tired. Like, I think he's tired of talking. He's tired. And he says this in verse 18. He says, I look for your deliverance, O Lord. I think he's just like, okay, I just don't know if I can do this anymore. So he moves really quickly with the last couple. Uh, you see Gad, Zilpah's son. You see him, um, I don't even know where his, I can't even see. Oh, he's the green right there. So that's his place. Gad will be attacked by a band of raiders, but he will attack them at their heels. The reason why he says that is because if you look, the, the, the Jordan River is on the left side, and most of the tribes are on the left, but Gad is on the right side of the Jordan River. So he will be attacked by raiders. There will be a lot of people that don't have to cross over the Jordan. Um, he goes on to Asher. He's the next one. He, Asher has really cool land. Up north, it's green, it's right on the Mediterranean. I want to be from the tribe of Asher. This is also why. Asher's food will be rich. <laughs> okay? Apparently I'm a foodie. He will provide delicacies fit for a king. Uh, the name Asher means blessed or happy. The tribe of Asher settled down to be an agricultural people taking advantage of the fertile land God gave them. Uh, Moses said that Asher was most blessed, referring to his wealth of olive oil and the security of its cities. Asher's food was rich, and the tribe even provided special delicacies fit for a king. So everything, like I said, that Jacob's saying is coming true. I thought this was funny. There was a, a husband and wife. They were having dinner at a fancy restaurant. And a few minutes after the dinner was served, the husband said, food looks great, let's eat. The wife says, well, honey, you always say a prayer before you eat. Like, 
why are you not doing that? And the husband said, oh, that's at home, sweetie. He goes, I'm sure the chef here knows how to cook. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, it's getting near Christmas. My jokes are getting worse. So there's that. Okay, Naphtali. Uh, Naphtali, as you can see, way, way up top there. He's, they're right on the Sea of Galilee, and he is one of Billa's kids. Naphtali is a doe set free that bears beautiful fawns. Um, I put Matthew 4.12 there. As you can see, Jesus refers to this particular location um, in verse 13, leaving Nazareth. He went to live in Capernaum by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. So you can see Jesus is bringing these places in. Then he finally gets to Joseph, his very, very favorite son that is second in command of Pharaoh. Everybody knows that Joseph is daddy's favorite. So I can imagine like all the boys are looking at each other, like rolling their eyes, like, well, here it comes. Daddy's going to like bless Joseph. But look what he says. He says, Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with his hostility. Now, it's interesting that Jacob uses the image of archers, and I think it probably describes like his brothers coming against him, you know, when he was falsely accused of rape, all of these things that happen in Genesis. He's saying, no, 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 he, all these bad things happened to him, but look at verse 24. He says, but his bow remained steady. His strong arm stayed limber. In other words, no matter whatever happened in Joseph's life, he stayed strong and steady, no matter what anyone ever did to him. And that's just a reminder to us that, that I want us to be the same way. And then Jacob tells everyone why Joseph could do that. He says this, Because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because the shepherd, the rock of Israel, because of your father's God who helps you, because of the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of the heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies below, blessings of the breast and womb. Your father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains, than the bounty of the old, age old hills. Let all these rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. I love how he said, Joseph made it through everything he did because we have an awesome God. He trusted God, we, he believed in God, and he kept that. He didn't get any land, remember, that was to his sons. Next one really quick, this is the last one, Benjamin. Benjamin is, as you can see, Rachel, the love of Jacob's life, ended up having Joseph, his favorite, and Benjamin, his other favorite. So, uh, baby Benjamin, this is what he says, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he devours the prey. In the evening, he divides the plunder. And it's weird to me that that's all Jacob says about him. Now, I think Jacob's exhausted. I think he's about ready to die. He's tired. He's trying to get everything out to these kids. And this is the last. He was done. No more long prophecies. Uh, but what you can see if you read your Bible, you'll be able to see that, that everything that Jacob said was absolutely true. That Benjamin, the people, his descendants, will be like ravenous wolves. They're going to devour people. Now, Saul, the first king in Israel, remember Saul who, who went and chased David and tried to kill him? He was a Benjaminite. He came from this tribe. Um, Saul murdered an entire town of priests in Nob. So every, like I said, he's a ravenous wolf. His descendants would be like that. That would make me sad. Saul of Tarsus, remember Saul who eventually became Paul? Um, he was a Benjaminite. He came from this particular tribe. But the worst part of this tribe was found in Judges 20. When you get to this in your Bible one day, there's this horrible scene where Israel, all the people in Israel were just doing their own thing. They just didn't care. They go to, down there you see the, the tribe of Benjamin. Um, it's uh, right above Judah. And so a Levite, a Levite man and his wife go into the city to, you know, to get some, to, you know, find a hotel or whatever. They go into a house. The men of the city surround the house. They, they get a hold of his wife. They rape her and then they murder her. The husband comes out and sees this, and he's like, what just happened? We're Israel. We're God's people. Wh why are you doing this? And he's so angry. He takes his wife that's dead. He cuts her up. He cuts her head off. He cuts her arms off. He cuts her legs off, legs off. And he sends each piece to every one of those tribes. And he said, enough is enough. You guys think you're the, you know, God's people? And look what's going on down in, in Benjamin's tribe. And I'm telling you what, every single person, men, fighting men came down to the Benjaminites. And we see it in uh, this verse here, the Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel. And on that day, the Israelites struck down 25,100 Benjaminites, all armed with swords. Enough is enough. So that is all of their kids. But this is why I love the Bible. 
Because everything that Jacob said thousands and thousands of years ago, what he prophesied has actually come true. And I always say this, what book can you ever read that, that tells you thousands and thousands of things that will happen, and then they actually do happen, 100%. Like, there are no books like that except the Bible. And so if you're here and you're just like, oh, I don't know if I really believe the Bible, well, here you go. If you don't believe the Bible, you should. And you should because of this exact reason. Because over 2,000 prophecies have come true. We have about 500 left. They are coming true moment by moment, especially with everything that's going on in Israel. They're end time prophecies, and we can just see it lining up exactly what God has already told us. And um, so I was thinking about this. If, if the prophecies are true and the Bible's true, then we should probably take really serious what Jesus says about him being the only way and what happens after we die. And so I think that that was what I learned from this. All right, let's go on to verse 28. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is what the Father said to them when he blessed them, giving each the blessing appropriate to him. Then he gave them these instructions. I am about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah, I'll push for time. There Abraham and, um, and his wife Sarah were buried. Isaac and his wife Rebecca were buried. And there I buried Leah. And this is where he wants to be buried. Uh, verse 33. Uh, when Jacob had finished giving his instructions to his son, he drew up his feet into his bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Now, when Jacob um, finished, uh, gathered to his people, 50 verse 1. Jacob, Joseph threw himself upon his father and wept over him and kissed him. Then Joseph directed the physicians in his service to embalm his father Israel, so the physicians embalmed him, taking a full 40 days, for that was the time required for embalming. embalming. The Egyptians mourned him for 70 days. Verse 4. When the days of mourning had passed, Joseph said to Pharaoh's court, If I have found favor in your eyes, speak to Pharaoh for me. Tell him, My father made me swear an oath and said, I am about to die. Bury me in the tomb I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. Now let me go up and bury my father, then I will return. Uh, Pharaoh said, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear to do. Now, we're just like really pushing it for time, so I don't know how we're going to do this. Uh, seven, he goes to bury his father. There's all these dignitaries. Everyone goes. Uh, and then let's go down to verse 14. Um, after burying his father, Joseph returned to Egypt together with his brothers and all the others who had gone with him to bury his father. And now that Jacob is gone, Joseph's brothers are terrified. They're absolutely terrified because they are convinced in their mind that the only reason why Joseph's been nice to them is because of their dad. He was like their buffer. So they send him this. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs he did to, we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Please forgive them the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to, to him, Joseph wept. He was so heartbroken. And the reason why is because he's like, I didn't, I didn't forgive my brothers because of my dad. I forgave my brothers because of God. Like, that's why he did it. Then his brothers were still terrified. So his brothers came to them and threw themselves before him and said, we're your slaves. And he's like, what? And it's so weir weird that they, they, that's what they thought. They were, they had, I always call it creating monsters. Like this, uh, Cheyenne, uh, Susie had a one-year-old birthday party. And it's an hour and 15 minutes to her house. We drive all the way out there. We'd just come back from California the day before. We stayed an hour and then we left. So I called her to talk to her and it would be like, hey, the party was great. She doesn't answer. I call her again. She doesn't answer. I created so many monsters in my mind. I was convinced Cheyenne was mad at me. I didn't stay long enough for a party. You know. And then she finally called back and she's like, oh, sorry, someone came over and that was it. But that's what happens. These guys are creating all these monsters. No reason for it. They're just creating, the, like, my, you know, Joseph's going to hate us and he's going to throw us in prison and all this. But look what Joseph says. Joseph said, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? And then he says something that you and I need to remember as the, the ultimate when it comes to Genesis. He said this, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. This is one of those but God statements. Joseph could look back over everything in his life, all that his brothers did to him, and feel no hurt, no bitterness, no anger, no vengeance, because Joseph understood this. God had been in this all along. And some of you really need to hear that. You don't have to die bitter on your deathbed. You don't have to die angry with someone. You have to look back and say, you know what? This is, it, what they did to me was evil, but God was in it all along. He wants to use this for good. 
He goes on to say, verse 21, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. He reassured them, spoke kindly to them. Joseph stayed in Egypt uh, with all his father's family. He lived to 110 years and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children. Also the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. And then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die but God will surely come to your aid and take you out of this land to the land he promised an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110 and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin. And with that is the end of the book of Genesis. And here is what I learned from this amazing book, that God had a plan from the beginning of time. And his plan began by using people. Adam, Eve, Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, Jacob. And he has a plan for your life too. And I want you to really walk out of here and know that. If you are a follower of Jesus, his plan for you and for me is for us to tell the people around us about him about the greatest event that ever happened in history, the death and resurrection of Jesus, that he is the only way to God. And the story of Jesus began in Genesis 3 with the very, very first prophecy about him. And what we learn from the whole book of Genesis through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob is this. It doesn't matter how we start. It does matter how we finish. I want us to be excited about where we're going after we die. I want us to be pointing people to Jesus on our deathbed as we're talking to those around us. I want us to care more for the things of God than the things of this earth. And I will tell you the only way to have that kind of a deathbed experience where, where you're excited to leave this earth is to know God. And the only way to know God is to study his word, the Bible. We opened Genesis two years ago with this tagline, the journey begins, and it does. This big epic adventure written by God himself doesn't end with Genesis. So here's what I, my challenge to you. I would love for you to continue studying the next book of the Bible on your own. Um, if you can go on Amazon, you can pick up this Exodus book, Be Delivered. It's a Warren Wearsby commentary. Do it in the mornings. Do it with some people, whatever. Don't stop at the end of Genesis. Continue on because I will tell you, you read Exodus, your faith will grow leaps and bounds as you see this powerful, magnificent God. So we leave the pages of, of Genesis. We will be continuing on in our Bible studies, talking um, John and Romans. And um, this is what I say. Please don't stop at the death of, of, of Joseph. Keep on going. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pray really quick. Uh, next week, we're going to be in Romans. For those of you that wonder if the Bible talks about homosexuality, the answer is yes. And next week, we will hit it really hard because it's, it's a huge portion of Romans where we're going to be. So come back for that next week. And um, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to put up, and you can just leave as the song is playing. This was a song called um, that God Was In It After All. And we had uh, Michael Land sing this, so you can listen to this as you're, as you're walking out of here. But um, thank you for those of you that started two years ago with us. I'm so proud of you. I just talked to someone, and she goes, I have learned so much through Genesis. And I'm like, yeah, it's kind of a cool book. So, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this amazing book. Thank you that we're done and that we're ready now to move on to something else. I pray that you would um, use all the stories in Genesis to change us, that we'll be people that love you more, know you better, and really are excited for the day, just like on, on Jacob's deathbed, where we can tell people about you. Thank you for that. Bless these women. In Jesus' name, amen.